Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. Today, I have a so a past guest of mine, one of my uh, favorite, most popular guests, been on the show uh, several times. Michael Garfield uh, reached out to me. He's very enthusiastic science communicator that sometimes throws me suggestions for other awesome people that uh, uh, that I should have on. And he insisted I have today's uh, guests on for a good reason. Has some really cool, interesting uh, stuff for uh, for being, especially for being so early um, in her career. From the Santa Fe Institute, Elena Maton is joining me today. Elena, how are you? I'm good, and you? I'm good. I got through that intro, which is, uh, I had to, I had, uh, what was that, three takes? We had three I takes so. at it. <laughs> yeah, I should have, I should include those one of these days. Like a bonus, bonus for a Patreon, just so listeners often get to hear me talk about how badly I screwed up intros over and over again, but they never get to see it. Maybe I'll include that as a bonus sometime. <laughs> Some kind how, of bloopers. <laughs> yeah, blooper reel, exactly. <laughs> how are you today? Good, good. Um, You're in Santa Fe? Yes, uh, which is why there's sun on one side of the, yeah, the screen, nice. which is the window side <laughs> yeah uh so uh, the santa fe institute it's kind of a it, it's it's sort of a um a, like a non-traditional uh unique sort of institute right yes um so it was really funded as a kind of almost experiment uh in terms of institution and trying to give freedom to people that are fairly early in their career stage to think about whatever they want, almost kind of freed-ish from the job market considerations and from traditional institutions like universities. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's that's really interesting. It's, it, it does that, um, I mean, this is some of the things that you talk about, right? And some and some of your work and some of the, I, I saw you have a, online course introduction to open science um that is available for free for people at uh i'm not going to read that whole long link so <laughs> it's included in the description of this show um and yeah so can you can you talk a little bit about that to start just sure. because uh I, I talk about how much I love online courses to listeners all the time so I'm sure there's plenty of listeners out there that are interested in having some recommended oh for sure um so uh, well part of my experience was I joined the institute just before covid started um so it did it ended up being um kind of a good time to have pet projects that are a bit different from usual and for me that was uh trying to get this thing that is a more teaching oriented materials. Mm. Um, and that came from, um, during my PhD, I used to already teach some kind of introduction to open science methods to incoming PhD students. Uh, so I just wanted to offer kind of expanded version of it. Um, and the Center of Institute has this great um, platform for online courses called Complexity Explorer. So this is basically an expanded version of what I used to give to incoming PhD students. And it's a bit more for general audience. So anyone who's curious to know how do we make science more transparent and more open to everyone uh, is like very welcome to see me talk about this for something like six hours of videos. Mm. Um, so what is uh, what is open science? So open science has a bunch of different definitions depending on who you ask. Um, and there's a part that is it's mostly a kind of social cultural movement where people really want to get scientific practice to be more transparent, more open, more inclusive. Um, and have this kind of almost a bit hacker-like uh, ideology to science. Uh, and there's also a kind of more practical aspect, which is open science is also this kind of laundry list of practices that actually help achieve this goal. Um, uh, can you repeat that last thing? Uh, uh, that sure. that uh, does what with the goal? 
uh, just... just help getting there basically oh, okay. uh so achieve your goals in terms of yeah just like making the scientific process something that people can actually see in a sense um but also verify um and partake into interesting yeah it's it's when you're talking about um kind of uh, letting letting younger people explore ideas outside of the typical job market that that resonated with someone I've never gone to college but I talk with a lot of professors I and I have um, uh, some of my very good friends are academics and and so I I go back and forth you know I just have this I guess I have a little bit of a contrarian attitude with no matter who I'm talking to, I, I tend to consider the opposite. So when I'm talking with, say, a philosopher or something, I'm like, yeah, but what are you going to do with that? Who even cares? Yeah. And then when I'm talking with my academic friends, sometimes I'll be sharing like some big idea about how I think consciousness works or this or that. And I'm just like, what? okay neat idea like i can't test that what and like if you can't test it and you can't write a paper about it yeah. why even be talking about such a thing um so could you talk about that maybe a little bit does that is, is that is that a little bit of 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 what the institute is doing is freeing people to explore something that maybe there's not the same clear academic or um, monetary path to uh, um, explore? I mean, the Institute, unfortunately, doesn't exist in a vacuum. So yeah. I think most early career researchers are aware that we have to return to the more normal system after our time at SFI. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for instance, this project uh, on open science was the kind of projects I would probably not have been able to do in a more classic university setting. Uh, and part of it is usually if you're teaching for university, the contents you're creating tend to be what they get people to pay you for. Uh, so they don't necessarily have the same attitude about putting them online for free. Mm. Um, and in general, the Institute provides a lot of freedom. So basically you can explore whichever questions you want. Um, and for instance, in my case, I... A lot of what I did used to be very cognitive science uh, and kind of applied case studies that are fairly narrow-ish in scope. Uh, so what I've changed in terms of my own research program since I moved here is getting a bit more into longer term cultural dynamics. Um, mm. So there's also a lot of freedom to kind of make your own research question evolve um, maybe a bit more dramatically than you would usually have in more classical trajectories hmm um well i would love to dive into that topic a little bit <laughs> sure. uh, longer term cultural studies is that what is that what you said uh yeah well for now i haven't really published anything yet so i don't know That's how good okay. my work on it is <laughs> That's um, okay. this is a very conversational uh, uh show so yeah you're you're giving us the scoop on, <laughs> a bit, on upcoming um, publications perhaps yeah, I've been working on basically a large synthesis of what made globalized trade uh, happen uh, and what was kind of the institutions and cultural practices that you needed to basically make this weird kind of exchange evolve. Uh. Love it. Hit me <laughs> with it. I, I so I don't I don't know if Michael told you much, but we we, we uh, I love thinking and talking about evolution. Um, and it's it's brought up quite a bit on this show. And so I, I know my listeners just are already used to thinking in, in terms of deeper time ideas and things as well. So yeah, set, set up uh, what's on your mind. What do you like noodling with in, in this domain? Oh, um, well, so far it's been mostly reading a lot of economic history and very dry texts. Um, so it Fun. might not be the most exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, it's probably something I should come back in a year or two when I actually have like well-rounded ideas about it. Okay. Um, but if you're interested in evolution, the field I work in is called cultural evolution, and it's a lot of applying the same kind of principles that people have applied to biological evolution, but to culture. 
yeah um, and to cultural practices well give me uh let's let's give the listeners some 101 on cultural evolution <laughs> okay um so cultural evolution is a pretty recent field uh in the sense of uh first papers were from the 70s uh and the bulk of cultural evolution really took off um late 80s early 90s uh so i feel like if a, my own field is pretty much my age, it feels pretty young still. Uh, and um, the main idea is, was really to just try to model what is different and what is similar between biological and cultural evolution. And in a pretty big sense, it's almost an outbranch of theoretical biology and population genetics. Like a lot of the model that cultural evolution was funded on are actually genetic po population genetics um, mm. kind of models. Um, the main difference uh, that has been on from 70s and Carly Sforza uh, kind of work that are like the very beginning of it tend to be um, that contrary to biological evolution, culture evolution uh, doesn't only have kind of parents to offspring transmission, but it will also get kind of diagonal. So people who are a generation older, but not your parents still transmit things to you and horizontal. So you also get uh, knowledge and transmission of cultural traits from people who are more or less your age group. Hmm. That's interesting. And, and sometimes we, we, uh, the, the younger, why did I say I, we, I wanted to include myself in a younger generation there. And I'm, I turned 42, uh, in a month. So I'm just, I'm really holding on to that as I'm in this younger generation. It's not the case, but young, younger people also, I guess I kind of never really thought about that, that, that younger, younger people end up, um, uh, end up driving a lot of, uh, of, uh, uh, influence in older people, uh, as well, which is like, you know, just in terms of say, teaching your parents some new technology or, or something like that. And if you think about something like the, music industry or a lot of entertainment out there where um uh, b because so much of it is is geared toward um the youth or or determined by the youth uh that that also then ends up influencing um people in higher generations which is which is something that uh in biological evolution things are only passed down um yeah um, so a lot of those ideas were really developed uh, with the kind of like longer human evolutionary history in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so meaning also how did we got technological progress and how did we kept technical traditions like making stone tools over thousands and thousands of years. I see. Um, and in those cases, it's, you, you don't get a lot of transmission from offsprings to parents. But, right, uh, right, right. Um, and actually, a lot of the theoretical background is called uh, dual inheritance theory with the idea that... Can you repeat uh, that? Dual inheritance theory. Yep, dual inheritance. Uh, origin, culture, co-evolution, like both names tend to be a bit interchangeable. And the main idea is that basically humans got this almost second inheritance system, um, which is kind of adding up to DNA. We don't only get DNA, but we also get cultural knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's part of how the human species adapted and uh, kind of took over the world. So, it, it, and so much of, but so much of cultural evolution too is, um, is driven by biological evolution too, right? I mean, a lot, a lot of the, uh, when you speak of of tool use, that's still that served a biological purpose. Those are still like a lot of technology and culture um, yeah. is, is sort of a phenotypic expression of of our own um, needs or desires to survive, advertise, mate, have social life, make friends, uh, that sort of thing, and. And, and so some of the culture that we create, I mean, I guess, how do you, it's, it's kind of hard to tease apart, but there's, there's usually this, um, this, what I would say, false dichotomy between like, is this biologically driven or culturally driven? And I tend to think that what gets left out of that is how much of culture was just an expression of our own inner biology. 
Yeah, I think it's really hard to get any kind of strong boundary between biological and cultural. Uh, mm. And exactly for that, like all of cultural evolution has this kind of strong idea that our culture is also part of our biology in a sense. Um, and that actually gets me to another point I wanted to explain a bit more. But mm -hmm. one of the requirements of thinking that way of culture as an inherited system that you keep through generations and generations means you also need to evolve um, a number of mechanisms that allow you to transmit information that way. Uh, and the idea is that that's also part of what makes humans unique as a species and incredibly cultural compared to most other species. Um, can you uh, can you go into that a little bit more? Sure. Um, so if you want to have this um, statement or assumptions that we are transmitting cultural uh, knowledge in the same way we're transmitting biological information and DNA, it means you also need to have uh, evolved some kind of cognitive mechanisms and practices and everything so that you can actually transmit information with a lot of fidelity. Um, mm -hmm. And also, depending on who you're talking to, how much you can select information and what are the ways you can actually uh, learn it. Um, and that's actually where I stand in not necessarily the most mainstream part of my field. Uh, so a lot of cultural evolution and social learning literature has really tried to make a point on how good we are at transmitting those information. A lot of the work I've been doing is more showing that you actually don't necessarily need to be good per se, uh, but you can still get very uh, stable things through times for other reasons, basically. <laughs> hmm. And uh, how, how much... In terms of um, when you think about cultural evolution and you think about what aspects of culture are uh, are selected for, um, it, it's it's when you're trying to transmit something through time, um, for example, it seems it seems like there's um, uh, it, and, and you're talking about that fidelity. It's it, it seems like there's a lot of like uh, games of telephone that happen through time. Like um, uh, it, it, everyone has some Einstein quote that they'll tell you, for example, and maybe like a tenth of them were actual Einstein <laughs> quotes. So they're most of them are just quotes made up by someone else and attributed to Einstein. And then often, um. Too, you'll you'll see uh, you'll see some like age old adage that um, that everyone uses like um, I don't know it, it, like mo most people I think if they first hear about or spread like say oh trickle down e economics or something don't aren't aware that mm -hmm. that was a satirical idea making fun of that very concept and now and then some people are like oh yeah and it trickles down and works perfectly so yeah. so there's there's lots of miscommunication over time so so uh, yeah i guess it, it, what what are your um it, how do you how do you even research or how how do you even understand um fidelity how do you how do you understand if something still has the intended uh use or place that it had a, a hundred a thousand years ago something like that um there's a lot of things to unpack in what you said uh yeah so... I, I have a tendency of doing <laughs> that take your time yeah i should have taken notes um, yeah yeah um, but one thing is, uh, when you mentioned the telephone game, um, the fun thing is it's actually the one type of experiments I run whenever I run experiments. Um, so you can do telephone games in laboratory settings, actually. So it's mm -hmm. a form of psychological experiments you can run. Uh, and it's kind of nice because then you can really record what are the changes people are making every time they're passing on, for instance, a story or, um, in the last one I personally ran, uh, it was a drumming kind of sequence. Um, so you actually really touched on that. That's actually the main way we can recreate those in experimental settings if we want to test specific hypotheses, because then we can create 
kind of like alternative variants of something that people would transmit. Uh, mm. So for instance, you're telling a story like the Little Red Riding Hood, uh, but you're changing one detail and you're checking whether people are going to actually change those kind of details back and kind of how good they are at telling exactly the same story. So you can score that with like, um, for instance, which elements are present whenever each participant is telling it. Mm. So you can make those kind of things tractable in kind of small-ish scales. At larger scales that are like more historical, it gets a bit trickier. Um, and it depends a lot on like which kind of cultural practice or cultural trait you're going to be trying to track through time. I, what about... Um, it, are there are there ways that you can kind of predict um, how in those games of telephone uh, mistakes will be made? Because there's certain there's this game Telestrations. It's like a drawing version of telephone. Okay. You get um you you get like a, a draw a um a unicycle or something like that, and then one person draws a unicycle with a short amount of time and then passes that drawing to the next mm -hmm. person. And then that person has to write what they think that drawing is and whatever they write, then they pass that word to the next person. So now they put um, a bicycle or something. And then the next person tries to draw that and then passes that to the next okay. person. And then they, they, and then they think it's a car or something like that. So then they draw that and it goes around for like eight people or whatever. And the picture that you get is is usually a completely different thing than uh, than the word that you started with. But it's still some people don't understand the game because they'll they'll be like, um, it's a tire made out of clowns or something. And it's like, well. That has to be something that was on a mm. card in the first place. It can't just be like an imagined <laughs> concept, you know, and 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 so so there are ways to like tease apart what something was meant um in in the past. Uh I don't know. Do you, do you know where I'm Here's a better example for you. Consciousness seems like a grand embellisher to me. So uh, so we tend to embellish things through time. Uh, uh, we go back and our founding fathers seem more and more uh, heroic and infallible and perfect and everything over time. Whereas you go back to when, say, the founding fathers were actually figuring out um, uh, some, uh, like the Declaration of Independence, I think they, they all got together to work on it. And it was really hot that day on the 4th of July and they opened up the windows to uh, let some breeze in and some some horse flies and stuff came in and started biting them. And so they're like, oh, whatever, just sign it. And that's how we have the Declaration of Independence. But most people now are like, this is the most important <laughs> A document ever and it was labored over over these perfect genius minds and so you you can you can estimate and you can predict that through time people will build up stories of the past and make them grander than what actually took place so are there are there things where you can kind of predict how things will deviate to some extent, yes. Um, so again, I'll, I'll be a bit more nuanced because it's much easier to do in the lab than in real life, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. Uh, so there are different uses you can do of those transmission chain experiments. Uh, and one of it is just giving different conditions. So you're giving stories that are kind of similar-ish, but for instance, one has like more gruesome details than the other. Yeah. And then you would tend to predict that, oh, if it has gruesome details, it's probably yeah. going to help with remembering it. Um, More salient, yeah. Uh, so those kind of things. Um, or you can think that if I write the story in a really over-the-top way, people are going to tone it down after retelling it a couple of times. So it's kind of you're creating a version that is kind of too extreme or too different on one dimension. And, and in that case, you can predict that usually it's going to come back to something uh, that makes more sense in a way. Oh, um, it, it, so it, it 
bounces back over time. It gets more It depends more reason- where you're starting from. Huh. Um, so at I least see. that's the way I see it. Uh, for the experiment I personally ran, what we did was basically giving people the same sequence to repeat, but depending on which conditions they were in, they had very different uh, movements to make for it. So we could predict that basically what they were going to do is adjust to what they could physically do. Um, we put them on purpose in like situations where they could not really do exactly the same thing they heard. Um, so we were kind of building in this, uh, you have different constraints. So what you're going to produce is going to reveal those constraints. Um, That's like the telestrations constraint. Yeah. Like it had to come from something realistic. So there's only so much you can do with your body or whatever at any given time. It's, it, what, what's that? Can you, can you go into a little more detail about that study? Yeah, so in this study, we had four conditions. So participants would be only in one of those conditions. Uh, and the first participant of the chain heard just some kind of metronome sequence. Mm-hmm. Um, so something totally normal. Depending on which condition they were in, they would have to do either large movements or small movements or a mix of both those type of movements. I see. Um, so basically what you have by the end of the chains, and I think we had six participants, long chains, um, you get sequences that actually reflect uh, those kind of differences. So people who had the large movement uh, still managed to have a metronome-like sequence, but with a larger, uh, what we call inter-onset interval. So that's just like how much time between the two taps. <laughs> mm. um, and people who had the mix of like small and long movements to do end up with things that don't sound anymore like a metronome because they have to adjust to having those small movements and then this long movement. Um, hmm. And actually, uh, we also put example sequences of that online. So if you want to uh, link them somewhere, I, I can give you the link. Yeah, please do. Huh. Um, yeah, because I one thing I can't get on my out of my mind as as we're kind of talking about this uh, game of telephone um, metaphor for cultural evolution is is um, uh, I had I had someone on talking about implanting memories, mm. um, and uh, there's a there, it's a pretty dark history of implanting memories. But there's fun studies that you can do with children, for example. And one of my favorite ones, my listeners might have heard me share this, is is um, is you have a magician come in to like a kindergarten class. They do a whole show, and afterwards. Uh, the big grand finale trick the musician's gonna or the magician did i say musician magician is going to pull a rabbit out of a hat mm-hmm. and uh and then he goes to like ta-da and the rabbit doesn't come out and he goes oh sorry i guess i screwed the trick up i, I gotta go and then one of the a couple of the the teachers will make sure that they're within an earshot of a kid and say that they saw the rabbit escape from the box so that the ki- like one of the kids overhears this there was never a rabbit there but then they go back a week later and ask those kids like what they saw what happened and the they have the grandest stories of they saw the rabbit jump out of the box and then it jumped out the window and was ran over by a bus and it's and, <laughs> and it just it, this epic tale that they have uh, that has developed within a week uh mm-hmm. time and it, it, i i don't know it's sort of it, it feels like uh, mythology and stuff uh, sort of does that um, a little bit. Or if you if you you watch the movie Braveheart and like you probably heard I was seven foot tall or whatever the the lines are, um, and so so but but that's interesting that there has to be some constraints to it too. Yeah. So. A kind of related way to think about the life of cultural things um, is to picture them as like those kind of things that keep changing state between being mental representations and public representations. So when you're telling a story, you're basically translating a mental representation into a public one. So when I'm Mm. talking to you, I'm translating what is my own thought, which is a, a private mental representation into a public one that you can hear. Uh, and when you're listening to me, you're basically doing the reverse operation. <laughs> you're getting the public representation, making it a mental representation. Yeah, I'm putting it in my own way. In my 
Um, and if tomorrow you think about the conversation we had today, uh, you're going to engage your process that are related to memory, which is just some kind of evolution of the mental representation through time. Hmm. Uh, so all those kind of different events that happen in the life of cultural things when they're transmitted are kind of sources of different types of changes and ways they're going to be adjusted. Um, so that, that's also why I'm not necessarily a huge fan of stories that really put forward how faithfully we transmit things. Uh, just because if you look at like psychology and kind of almost each one of those tiny links you get in the world story, they tend to be more about things changing than about things remaining the same. Hmm. And in, in terms of kind of how cultural ideas get selected for and, and um, kind of mimetic evolution or whatever. How, mm -hmm. how much of, is there a factor in, cause we all see things go viral and you see, um, uh, it, you see some trend on TikTok of dancing in some certain way gets popular for a while. Then people got to dance in a different way. And then people post pictures of their food and now everyone's posting pictures of their food. And now, no, we don't like that anymore. No one, post pictures of their food it's so dumb and but so so there's trends mm -hmm. and there's 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 like the fashion of it but then there's there is utility involved too whereas if you have ideas that lead to um say more stable cultures or more offspring like like say two different cultures attribute a belief that um you know, this uh, uh, an earthquake happens and breaks two uh, identical, like a city apart. And now these two uh, once identical cultures are are um, are separate. And one side believes that the earthquake was caused because uh, they they were. Uh, they were having too much sex, so they shouldn't have sex anymore. And then the other culture uh, believes like, oh, that must have been a God punishing us for not being fruitful and multiplying enough. And it, obviously the one that says that believes in the being fruitful and multiplying version of that is going to have a denser population within generations than the one that stopped having sex for some spiritual reason or whatever, uh, explanatory reason. And so that idea itself um, is the one that ends up winning in the sort of cultural evolution. And then it also, it also influences biology in a way because people are spreading their genes more because of a cultural belief. Yeah, there are quite a few explanations that tend to be kind of on those lines. Um, and I think a lot of them tend to be cultural group selection. So we have this idea that you can really get groups that just end up um, having better fitness outcomes in a sense, simply because they have some specific beliefs and they led to better outcomes on average. Um, there's another aspect which has been the whole um, hypothesis on whether you need to have like moralizing God to get high scale color operations. Um, so the idea is that if you evolve uh, beliefs in gods that are called moralizing or high gods, um, that means gods that you know, care about humans behaving morally for real, uh, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so not necessarily the Athenian gods who have their own stories, more like the gods, like uh, the Christian God who cares that you are a good person. Having those type of beliefs is going to help um, having a society overall that is more cohesive and uh, that should lead to larger scales. So it's like very much the kind of hypothesis that are getting tested now by different types of large scale databases. Uh, and with pretty strong conflicts and <laughs> opinions on both sides. Um, mm. But those are definitely uh, kind of uh, scientific hypotheses that exist and that are championed by different people at the moment. Hmm. So what happens when, because you can think of a belief um, like that emerging, having a lot of use in not just not just making things easy for parents to be like, Hey, you know, even, 
even when I'm not around to watch you, just bear in mind, there's something Santa Claus is watching you. So be on your best behavior. And and so there's kind of an eye in the sky uh, sort of a surveillance system happening. And then but then what happens when like actual populations or technology advances that now they're um, now there's say police departments and now there's video cameras places that sort of serve the same purpose as that story once did um it, does it, would you say that 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 story becomes um less necessary or changes or uh I, I I don't I don't even, or do you do you even care to speculate? I have <laughs> what are your what are your thoughts about? Um, so yeah. to be fair, it's a bit different from things I work on. So it's okay. more like debates I'm aware of uh, right, right. than things I really have skin in the game on. <laughs> okay. Um, I tend to believe that those are just in general in the scope of like punishment oriented institutions or surveillance oriented mm-hmm. institutions. Um, so in that sense, that do serve similar functions, uh, but they do so in probably fairly different ways. Hmm. Uh, but I have a very mild opinion and no <laughs> no strong speculation to offer on this. I'll take it. Well, let's get let's get some skin in the game. What uh, what kind of projects um, have you been working on? Uh, uh, like, what's can you share? Yeah, you know, let's go back in time a little bit. Why don't you share some of your background and? how you got into studying what you do okay uh so i don't know how far back you want to get uh but i did my ba in sociology in paris then a master in uh, cognitive science also in paris and moved to hungary and to the central european uh, university which was then in budapest um for my phd which was also technically in cognitive science Hmm. So that's kind of my general background. Um, And um, most of what I've been working on is trying to explain why cultural things have the shape they take and why it's not an independent question from why they actually are cultural things. So what I mean by that is uh, the reason some things get cultural, so a bit in the same sense they get viral, but they remain stable through time. And, you know, if I tell you about the Little Red Riding Hood, you know what I mean. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's some kind of type you can recognize that has existed for a while. Uh, So this is just this sense of something being cultural that I use. Um, The idea is uh, part of why that's the case is because it has several characteristics that make it easy on human cognition or a good fit with human environments. That is roughly the general framework I work with. And a lot of what I did during my PhD was really oriented towards cognition because I was in a cognitive science department. Uh, So I studied things um, about, for instance, graphic communication, because we know quite a fair amount of things on how our visual system works. So that basically gives you kind of a good indication of what is the... Kind of, if you think of culture as a program, that gives you a good sense of what is the laptop you need to make it run on, uh, in a sense. Um, And uh, yeah, so I've been just trying to play around with what can we show as an impact on which things become cultural and successful or not. Um, And that's a kind of first part of what I've been doing. Can can we explore that a little more? Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, where do we start? Uh, where do you want to start? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, maybe just um, some of the some of the work that you did in that specific area. So my very first research projects were oriented towards medical beliefs and practices, uh, and the very first paper I published uh, was on why did people use bloodletting so much as a medical practice around the world. Mm. Um, And the idea is it's actually in this weirdly kind of nice spot cognitively uh, because it's disgusting. So it's kind of memorable. You're going to probably tell stories about bloodletting if you see it happen. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it has advantages that other kind of disgusting cures uh, like emetics, which make you vomit, don't have. 
Um, so for instance, if you're using bloodletting, you can choose to bleed the part of the body that aches. Uh, and in turn, that gives you some kind of advantage in terms of binding, recovering with the fact that you actually got some kind of bleeding. Mm. Um, so that was uh, kind of where I started. <laughs> I, lo- I <laughs> love that. If, if you, if that's uh, just whatever, whatever is, uh, if your knee's a little sore this week or something, you just take a little blood out of your knee. <laughs> there you go. Um, they also have actually quite a pretty large diversity and creative ways to bleed people uh, around the uh, world. Well, okay, uh, that's I'm glad we got into this. <laughs> so I can't. What if we would have went a whole episode without talking about bloodletting? Can you imagine that par- <laughs> that dull parallel universe that almost existed where we didn't dig into bloodletting? Um, all right, so this is like this is clearly. This is, it's salient. Your ears perk up just hearing about it, talking about it. And so this is in your in, in your way of looking at it, part of why it was such an impactful treatment is just because everyone's like, what the heck is that? Uh, not necessarily what the heck is that, but more like, oh, this is something that I will remember. Yeah. Uh, like you don't really need to put effort in remembering it. Um, and also it matches a lot of beliefs you <laughs> tend to have, uh, cause a lot of systems people add about understanding why you get sick is you get something that is kind of wrong in your body. And yeah. I think it's pretty good because in that case, you just feel like you can get this out and done. Um, yeah. so you, you get those kind of advantages that make it kind of nice on the human mind. Um, it's got all the right things in place for a placebo effect. It's it's costly, so it's just there's this uh, after the fact. I mean, th- there's always the mind's always so protective of the ego. So it's like, well, I'm not an idiot. I wouldn't have just sucked half the blood out of my arm for no reason at all. So <laughs> well, it and must have done something, right? Another thing is also most of the kind of ailment or sickness you're going to have are going to regress to the mean. Like you're not going to stay sick. But if you've done something, you can still have this kind of false idea that it's because you did the thing that you got better, even if it's not the case. People have been, people are becoming um, more and more familiar with this as uh, we're uh, two years into a pandemic before people, people are used to hearing about various treatments and then the person magically gets better. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, and, and it's, it's also, it's also, if it doesn't work, you don't, you don't need to blame the bloodletting. It's just that the bloodletting wasn't enough or it was like, oh, well, we took, we didn't take enough blood probably that's what it, or, you know, must've just got the wrong spot. Try again, a little higher on the leg next time or, or something. We, we know the blood letting works. <laughs> so maybe the illness was just too powerful for even such great blood letting. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's definitely ways that cultural practices of what people do interact with what they believe. Um, But I think it's still a question we don't necessarily know a whole lot about. Well, it's also nice because someone else does it for you. I don't think there were a lot of people self, were people self bloodletting? So in the ethnographic extract we looked at, um, it was in most cases someone else who does it. But the part is, uh, it's actually not very detailed. The data we had couldn't tell us, like how often someone does it on themselves versus like, I having want someone, someone else do it. with like a title. You know, I, I want someone like wearing something official seeming, whether it's a lab coat or some sort of ritualistic wardrobe or something. Like get get dressed up a little bit if you're gonna blood let me i feel like it'd make me believe it I, uh, you know like this isn't just mm-hmm. <laughs> this, this isn't something just anyone could do um so actually part of that study we also had a transmission chain with a tiny story and we're hoping that if an element on the story really matters people are going to recreate it if we remove it from the story 
Um, and that was the case of whether things were co-localized. So whether the character in the story was getting bled at the same place on the body as uh, where it was hurting. Um, and that works. Like people will actually recreate that. If you mismatch the, the those two places, uh, after a while, they get back to being the same. Oh, so so if... Let me, let me make sure. I, am I clear on what you're saying here? So you're saying someone has an arm problem. They go in for a bloodletting. They let blood out of the leg instead. But upon remembering this story, people will remember it as being blood let out of the arm because that was the original diagnosis. Yeah, that in was, our case, it was uh, migraine, so head hurting, and they were bled okay. on the foot. Uh, and that's the story we're telling participants. But when participants remembered it, there's a couple of times where they would kind of correct it. But like, yeah, they were bled on the end too. Um, mm. And funnily enough, there's a point where we tried to have a version uh, where you would have uh, either the bleeding made by the person or the bleeding made by someone else uh, who would be some kind of healer. Uh, and that didn't work out for the very, very trivial reason that in English, uh, by him, and there's just like a thing about English language that made it indistinguishable and encodable from what participants were retelling us. Um, mm. So... Uh, like that's one of the things we also found about at some point, but couldn't actually test. No. How far back did that go? When did the when did that start? When did that? It, does anyone have any idea who <laughs> the the first culture that's that where bloodletting took off? Uh, very first, I don't think with any kind of certainty. Uh, for like kind of the European um and like Europe plus Africa and Asia kind of continent, mm -hmm. um, you can get back to at least ancient Egypt. And that's usually kind of the story people tell. It's like Egyptians did it, they gave it to the Greeks who gave it to the Romans and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least a few thousand years. Uh, and you have other traces that are archeological. So basically having artifacts that seem to have been used for bloodletting uh, on the, in Mesoamerica, but I'm honestly not sure of the dates and I don't want to butcher anything. So, um, but at least a thousand years or two ago. So not only is, would you say that the same characteristics that make um, some cultural transmission memorable also aid in its transmission? Um, cause a, a lot of these things like salience that the yeah. brain remembers, you, you tend to, you, you tend to want to gossip about those same or, or share, you know, someone, someone, you, you said that you went through a whole bunch of like boring, uh, research to, you still pull out the exciting parts and those stick with, and then you end up wanting to share those more exciting parts as well. And this is just kind of human nature. And I, I suppose uh, co both cultural memory and transmission works on a lot in a lot of the yeah. same ways. No, no, that's exactly part of it. Is usually the things that make you remember things. They don't necessarily are the exact same things. It's the thing that make you want to tell the story. But for instance, if I think of the over and read extracts I recorded of uh, people practicing bloodletting in different ways. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to want to tell you about that uh, one where they have a specific tiny bow and arrow to shoot people in the temple more than <laughs> one of the yes. thousands that just have some kind of scalpel. Right, right. Um, yeah, yeah. The little weird bloodletting crossbow <laughs> to the temple. Yeah, you can't leave that one out. Um, but yeah. that was one out of the, like, the one abnormal... No, exactly. Or like, for instance, I can remember one that was uh, actually recommending to cut an artery. Um, I'm still not sure this one actually played out in real life. I just have the record from the ethnographer that was there. Um, but um, yeah, it's like there are definitely things that seem easier to remember, but part of it is not necessarily just memory. It's also... I'm going to tell you the stories that I think are more relevant to you or like are going to have the most interest in the conversation in a sense. Mm. Uh, so that's also another kind of type of cognitive processes that are going to influence which stories we're telling. Um, hmm. 
Now I'm thinking about inoculation because it's are are, are you familiar with the, the that some of that early history because that took a really long time to I mean people are still nervous about vaccines today but 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 the the origins were like it was more of opening up a vein and like taking pus from pox off of people and putting it like in a avocado or something like that to s- scoop out to put into someone's open vein and and when that was when that was first i mean i think there was there's always a zillion factors with any of these things i think it was uh originally kind of brought to europe by a female females weren't like re- respected for their scientific insights at the time it was also it was also um uh uh, uh, from an area that was considered, you know, like savage people or whatever by the by the Europeans. So maybe it was like a cultural thing that seemed odd. But I think it took about seventy years or something like that from the from the time the idea was introduced to Europe to the time that that um and the 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 vaccine um uh changed some along the way and became a little more efficient and reasonable and and less dangerous but still it 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 took a while to get hold which is like that's almost the exact opposite of what happened with the in the bloodletting story yeah so uh, actually you're kind of the perfect host because you keep just on guessing what else i've done for my career Uh, really (laughs) yeah so actually my second paper was on vaccination and why it's why exactly it's that, that kind of like opposite case uh, how did i how did i do I, uh, what was I, I, my I what was my representation there um so well, yeah, no, i always you're... thought if i pull from enough things that like well they probably can't don't know enough about this specifically to call me out on my bs but was i was that a fairly accurate representation of of what happened so I'm not so sure about it coming necessarily from the new world. Uh, at least that's, I mean, I'm not super familiar with the history per se, mm-hmm. uh, because part of it is uh, the elements that are really relevant in terms of history for me are kind of limited, but mostly what we have is we basically have the same reactions now that we've had since vaccination yeah. was invented. And there are yeah. good reasons for that because you're still keep having the same elements. And um, a lot of what I was putting forward in 2015, which, by the way, was a great idea to write about vaccination before a pandemic. I didn't know that was going to happen, but uh, that was great for citation rates. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> um, but yeah, the idea was exactly to contrast it with the bloodletting case. So bloodletting is people are doing something that is not giving them health benefits and that you would rather have them not do it. And vaccination is this opposite case where people are not doing the thing you wish they were doing. Yeah. Um, in a sense, or the thing that they should be wanting to do. Um, and there's definitely this thing that uh, vaccines are still perceived as something dangerous you're putting in your body. So it's kind of normal to not be super chilled at the idea in the first place. Um, and especially if you don't necessarily have a lot of scientific knowledge or don't really understand the arguments on why it would work. Yeah, uh, I don't need to add things into my body. I just need to take out the bad stuff. <laughs> but it's also like, you know, if I'm telling you, oh, I'm going to put a virus and, you know, I don't necessarily explain to you right, how I deactivated right, right. before giving it to you. Um, you know, it's kind of fair that you're not going to want me to come over with a huge searing and be like, hey, come here. Um, mm-hmm. So the idea is also that usually when you get those kind of like counterintuitive things, um, if you want them to spread, you need people to be able to understand the arguments behind it and to trust the people who are going to give you those arguments. The problem that you get, especially in our contemporary societies, is people tend to distrust the sources of information on those. So you kind of also cut this um, almost like second path that p- things could have gone through. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I mean, what about... I, I, I I would maybe argue because you see a lot of uh, um, uh, responses during this um, uh, during this pandemic where people are like, well, how how could you trust the medical establishment? Why would you trust this and that? And part of me when I when I look through pandemic history is just like, oh, 
I, I think you could have just said people just distrust. And then the medical establishment is there for people to like take aim at. I, mm -hmm. I just I just think that um, it it seemed like the the witch trials started up during the during the Black Plague, where the same thing there's m medicine healers or whatever they're probably doing bloodletting and all sorts of crap that didn't work. But w it, that was w when the idea of uh, of at first everyone was just doing magic, and then during that time it was light magic or dark magic which was just an outcome bias if someone recovered they had done light magic if someone didn't recover they had done dark magic to them and if they had done dark magic then they were like an evil witch and needed to be destroyed and then if there's even a chance that and then it and then it spread and spread and so but it, but it also just seems like in moments of of uh large existential stressors and uncertainty and lack of predictability and control that seems like people's uh, 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 people's trust in any kind of authority um, is is diminished. It can actually kind of go both ways. Uh, okay. I, I think in the sense of like, you could also make arguments that people really just want strong leaders they can follow when you have big crisis. Mm. Um, I think the problem is um, like trust is not something you can figure out while you're in the middle of the crisis. Uh, and I think, you know, if you want my two cents on part of the whole mess that the last two years have been, um, I think the problem is not necessarily what was done when the crisis started, it's what was not done before that. Um, yeah, yeah. And part of it is you cannot ask people to suddenly trust you because circumstances have changed. And in general, um, it's more for like really long term uh, work in progress to have institutions that people can trust. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, hmm. So yeah, so sometimes people, I mean, the wanting strong leadership, that seems like times of war more often than uh, like uh, don't people vote for strong leadership and and kind of favor I these remember ideals seeing more? a bit of psychology work on that but honestly that's not things I've worked on directly so I <laughs> like yeah, I, yeah. I don't really know much about it uh, I mean I, I guess I just only make the point that that pandemics seem like a, a different where there's kind of a invisible counterintuitive a virus in and of itself is counterintuitive it took uh it wasn't until recently that we had germ theory before that people didn't even know that there was like oh a thing that you can't see that travels and spreads and infects other people and so there's there's something very counterintuitive about the problem in general whereas it seems like economic strain or war is like you can kind of see it you can conceptualize it a little easier. Going well, back to your graphic communication mm -hmm. and the ability to uh, visualize things and like availability heuristics, that sort of thing. So um, the thing is actually for um, the ideas of contagion, they are pretty intuitive and pretty easily uh, triggered just because people have a lot of mechanisms evolved for disgust. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's kind of like the first form of contagion. So, the idea of contagion, and even sometimes things that are not necessarily visible, being able to kind of contaminate or degrade the quality of something, I think is not necessarily counterintuitive uh, per se. Uh, viruses mm -hmm. are a specific form of it, and probably part of it is coming from more like scale. And the fact that it's not really recruiting or some other representations we have easily. So, for instance, uh, the kind of most common explanation for being sick before the modern world is basically someone's after you and it's more like witchcraft oriented. Right. Um, so those are like is kind of easier on human cognition because you're just recruiting those kind of feelings and uh, ways to represent the social world. Mm -hmm. So it's... I, I just wanted to say it's kind of half true <laughs> what you said in the sense of you do get ideas of contagion that, that um, you're that you're giving me half is like that's very <laughs> generous that's a much higher score than I usually get on this show that's okay. great 
50 percent. that's terrific i know that's failing in an academic but on this show that's a win for me <laughs> Um, Good. No, that's uh, but that's interesting. Could could you go into that a little bit more? Because I don't know. That seems like that seems like a whole. Um, yeah, I I don't know. That seems that seems like a whole that that's a very complicated conversation because we do have all of these evolved discussed features and sorry, we're probably going off the rails from your research a little bit, but, but, but it's, it's relevant to uh, these, these um, idea, like early ideas of quarantine and stuff probably did seem uh, we had evolved functions to, even if you see someone with like a broken leg or whatever, there's, there's, things that we evolved to at first be like, whoa, is that a contagious thing? Should <laughs> let's just err toward the side of caution. And um and you can see people rate people lower in attractiveness and other things like that. If there's some sort of wait, something off is happening here. Just there's a better safe than sorry kind of policy. Certainly if if like sneezing or coughing um it, and being around that was good for people. We would have evolved to be attracted to that and run up to anyone that's sneezing and try to get as much of it in as we we could. So obviously there was there were these evolutionary pre biological pressures over time to be like, oh, like oh, gross. I don't I don't want to be around that. But in our in our modern world, we're so detached from so many. Uh, we have most sick people. We don't. We aren't in a tribe with them anymore. They're at home somewhere else. We don't see them. They're in a hospital. You don't see, <laughs> you aren't interacting with the stuff on such a, on such a level. Um, that it's, I don't know. It just seems like, especially with something like asymptomatic spread, not just COVID, but sexually transmitted diseases or anything asymptomatic, it seems like, you you would think it would be confusing for the brain that we've evolved with. Yeah, uh, no, that's definitely more problematic than things that are very symptomatic. Because you know, if, if you see someone who keeps coughing and sneezing, you, you definitely have this reaction of not going towards them. Yeah, uh, things that are asymptomatic or that you know can be contagious, not if at the same time they're showing symptoms, are kind of like the mean ones uh, for humans in terms of behavior. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Um all right. Well, going back to Oh, did you did you have more uh, any other research that you did in in terms of the graphic communication that you wanted to talk cuz oh, right now sure. we're at the stage of your career where you got you are getting your PhD at this time. Actually, right? all medical stuff was before my PhD. Before the PhD. <laughs> so this is before Okay, so well I know I know that we're still like we're not to present day. This is still like earlier on when you were doing no. the, the graphic communication stuff. So and graphic so blood communication. Is one and then um, yeah, so all the graphic communication stuff is things that I've started as part of my PhD and I'm still pursuing. So it's been kind of like a long run thread of my work. Okay. Um, well, that was fun. Let's uh, let's go into some more of uh, of the that you might have set the bar a little high with bloodletting. I, I'm going to be thinking about that for <laughs> um, a while. Yeah, I'm not sure if the rest is going to be as fun. But that's okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, all things uh, graphic communications where uh, I worked with Olivier Mohan, uh, who headed the Minds and Traditions Research Group in Germany, mm -hmm. which is really a research group that focused on graphic communication and traditions that are using graphic communication. Uh, and it's someone I actually met uh, when he was a TA my first semester of university. So it's probably my only collaborator was the slightest idea what I looked like when I was 16. Um, but uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, so it's been a long time and we've worked in the first place on coats of arms. Uh, so like which kind of shapes you find on uh, those like medieval kind of emblems. Fun. Uh, yeah. So most people now are familiar with them just like from Game of Thrones or fantasy kind of things. Uh, but they used to be a pretty well-spread thing in Europe and you have pretty systematic records of it. 
which if you want to test any kind of hypothesis in a quantitative manner is great. Like having uh, dozens of thousands of data points is always nice. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so we tested a bunch of things in terms of how uh, our elements of codes of arms recombined uh, based on their frequency to create new ones. Um, we also <laughs> did... This is, this is, I want to get into this a little bit. Okay. This is, this is early branding. This is, this is early, this is early graphic design. This is, this is now what people do for their entire living is come up with the slick, interesting, eye catching, memorable logo design for, for people. What was, what was workshopping like back, uh, back in medieval times? Did they, <laughs> did, did you, did you just have one person in charge of the branding? Did they, did they wait and put some badges on? And then if you lost a battle, you'd be like, you know what? It was probably the emblem. We should probably change, <laughs> change um, that. So usually, uh, it was just either a family or a branch of a family that would have their own emblems. Uh, so there's okay, a fair yeah. amount of them being passed through times. Um, there's also a fair amount of them being designed uh, on purpose. Uh, maybe it's going to sound a bit disappointing, but at least for the ones we could have good data on. So ones that are relatively simple and relatively geometric and that we could like kind of break down with color one, color two, and what is the pattern on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be that you can predict a fair amount of the distribution just based on what is the frequency of each one of those elements. Um, so basically, it's kind of what comes up to your mind as like, based on how often you've seen it, each of those parts. Hmm. Oh, well, I want to get into that a little bit more because <laughs> okay. now I'm like, because I'm sure there was a lot of missteps along the way where you see someone and it's like, well, that person's got a cool emblem. I'm going to tweak that a little bit. And then you have like a turkey on your arm and everyone's like a turkey. You know, like, it's like, like, well, no, that's a, that, that's a, a flaming Phoenix rising from the, <laughs> the ashes. You're missing all of the good stuff. You're, mm. you're missing the fire. You're missing all the, the power. You just have a dumb Turkey on your arm. <laughs> <laughs> so actually that's, more about the other study we ran on it. So the first study really had just abstract things. So okay. we didn't add turkeys or phoenixes or anything. <laughs> okay. But the other study we ran was on what is the visual complexity of the motifs you find. So like those things like rabbits or eagles or whatever kind of motifs that is cataloged in the sense. Because what's great about coastal farms is there were people that were literally just scholars in it and wrote huge catalogs with like drawing by hand uh whatever people had and with their names and like descriptions every family's emblem and yeah things. and you get this like nice typology where if you talk about what's a unicorn uh in heraldic terms it really refers to a pretty specific type of motifs like there's not too too much variation now it's supposed to look like um and what we were interested in is uh there is this low in linguistics called zip's law of abbreviation which uh, posits that you tend to use shorter signals for things that are not too informative, so things that tend to be more frequent. So, for instance, if you take the English language, uh, the most frequent word, I think, is a, uh, uh, like just the A letter. Mm -hmm. And it's also the shortest. Um, and if you're wanting to convey more information, you usually use longer words. So, for instance, informative is a fairly informative word, um, ironically enough. And it's also a long one. So you do get this kind of like way to optimize language based on how frequently you use uh, short signals versus long signals. And we were kind of and curious. And if you use it more, it becomes yeah. info. Yes, exactly. And that, that's exactly the point. It's like if it becomes more frequent, you're going to tend to try to shorten it. So you actually can still save on the cumulative cost of communicating. Hmm. What about just physical distance in a time like that? If you wanted someone to see, you just you, you you don't want someone to be close enough to see the nuance of like what kind of bird or like lettering or whatever is on this. You just want a bold color so people know like, hey, stay away from me or I'm on your team. Um, so what we tried was just checking the frequency and versus the how 
complex or how long in a sense a motif is, which is something we can calculate with kind of computer vision types of methods. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't get this kind of uh, things that like you see in ZipSlow with like simple ones being very common and longer ones or more complex ones being less common. We get something that is kind of a bit amorphous in the beginning, but once people get more automatized way like stamps uh, or like more mechanic ways to uh, create things, they tend to become more iconic and more complex. So people are suddenly like, oh, it's not such a pain to have this very sophisticated eagle. So I'm going to get an eagle now. Mm. Um, which is nice because iconic motifs are another way to be easy on human brains in a sense, because you can recognize what they are. Um, mm. That's special. It has an eye in a pyramid coming to a pinnacle. I get that this is important. It's about some bigger picture existential belief thing. Whereas Turkey, we don't know what that means. You butcher, you into birds. Um, um, so what kind of, what kind of, uh, uh, yeah, I guess what kind of patterns would you see um, within iconic symbols through time so it's anything that is going to represent something figuratively um and there's a whole bunch of things that are just animals so definitely like eagles rabbits fishes uh my personal favorite is the dolphin because you can tell by then they didn't see many dolphins so they just describe it as a fish <laughs> with a nose and that's really what the drawing looks like yeah um so you get animals you get things that tend to kind of refer to um jobs like um things that are tools from specific crafts <laughs> and you get a bunch of things that are kind of just classic heraldry um well you also get flora like plants uh, but you also get things that are kind of classic heraldic motifs like towers or parts of um, knight's armor. Uh, and I think that's that's probably covering most of them. Hmm. Is it, that's... <laughs> that dolphin thing is so funny. You've, you've probably heard of the mermaids and manatee yeah. stuff too. And I, I guess one of the... Because it must have been so fun being an explorer because you'd just like get some boring new bird, but then you could come back with a story about it. This is the, this bird is from paradise itself. Uh, like, These are birds of paradise. Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, there is, there is, and it's so influential that then it changes people's perception too. Cause the, the mermaid story, when, there, there were people that later on came and then saw manatees and then they were like, look, these mermaids are not as hot as we've built them up to be. Not, not like that's not a mermaid. That was a misunderstanding. Just like, you know, they had more masculine features than I was expecting. Thing, like descriptions like that that were like when you're so primed to see something in a certain way um that has nothing to do with anything but entertaining nonetheless i, well, I mean that i do gets back to the retelling and how people transform things in a yeah sense. yeah well because even <laughs> even thinking of something like a dragon there's a, oh man if you could have a dragon emblem no one would mess with you but that that's such an interesting combination of things too it's got it's got snake scales it's got like hawk talons it it, and um and it it's it's got like a lion face that's those are those are like the combination of three things that most primates would want to be wary of <laughs> you know lions hawks and snakes those are like what primates have calls for and humans have uh, humans have just clumped them together of like this is the archetype of like whoa that's scary and dangerous and deadly uh, <laughs> yeah you kind of created almost a super stimuli in a sense for yeah, humans yeah. Uh, um and hmm. actually that's just like to to 
get going on the ideas of monsters in general, they're they're just like kind of in between where when you see monsters, they usually still respect a lot of organization principles you expect about animals. Like they have a mm-hmm. front and a back and an organization that is still very mammal-like in a sense or yeah. uh, like, you know, bilateral plan and all that. Um, so you still yeah, generate them random. follow. Yeah, you still generate them following your own cognitive constraints. But then, you know, you hem them up in terms of how dangerous they are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's always danger elements. It's never mm-hmm. like, that monster had 18 butt cheeks. There's <laughs> always <laughs> there's always things that are, that, that are very human-like. But just if you take a human and then embellish the most dangerous or scary elements uh, of it. And that... That's, I think I think that was um, that was uh, some some of the early zombie and ghost story stuff around the Middle Ages when um, in the in toward the beginning of Halloween origins too, where that was around the time of grave robbers and um, and they'd dig up a body and they didn't understand decomposition and so they would see they would dig someone up that's been like starting to decompose and their skin's crawling with worms or whatever they they're like bloated and or like air is released so it looks like movement or whatever and then you build up that um that story into ghosts or zombies haunting you or whatever um so uh which goes back to um kind of the original point I was after, which which I, I I guess you had a, you said that it oscillates back and forth, but but just just that a lot of these things just seem to. It seems like you can predict in many cases that if the game of telephone is going to go off the rails through time, it's going to be toward the side of embellishment and making something bigger than it was. Yes, if it was something like small, um, if you start with something that is like huge and really unbelievable, that's less likely to get bigger. I so, see. so that's what I meant by it oscillates. It's like it depends on what is your starting state. Hmm. Um, uh, well, what do you, uh, as, as we start to wrap up, what sort hmm. of, what sort of things have you been working on lately that you've been excited about? Oh, so I haven't really finished on the graphic complexity graphic systems part. Uh, So just like one of the, and that's going to get into what I'm excited about now. Oh, great. Uh, So uh, I've been working on writing systems as well. uh, And we had a pretty nice large scale study out last year on it. Um, And one of the fun thing is a lot of what makes uh, characters in the system more or less complex is actually how much information they are transmitting in the sense of what is the linguistic unit and how much phonetic information you're putting into it. Uh, so that was a pretty nice result. Uh, but one exciting thing that kind of came out of the data set we collected and that we've made of since is this citizen science app called Glyph um, that we're starting to get data from and like writing code to analyze it. Um, and the idea is uh, people just see writing systems and we're asking them to give us rules to parse them out uh, so we can figure out basically how did writing systems choose to explore different possible shapes uh, to maintain some kind of distinctiveness between the characters um, so you could recognize them. So that's mm. definitely one of the projects I've been excited about. <laughs> like ver- various various alphabets and things through yeah. time? Cool. Uh, what what have you found? Uh, we're still collecting data, so people can still go play with it for now. <laughs> I don't know yet what we're going to find with it. Uh, and yeah, it's another project with the research team based at the Max Planck. Uh, and it's led by one of my colleagues, Yulim Kim, uh, who's done an amazing job at getting the whole applet running. Uh, so it's been a really fun and cool project in that sense. Um. Now, am am I wrong in thinking that like Chinese lettering is just so fantastic and artistic? Is it is it just the fact that I'm so bored by the letters that I grew up around and I'm familiar with that you say 
it, you know, A is the most con- I'm like, A, boring old A, everyone no. knows A, whereas the things that I don't see, I'm like, wow, it seems magical almost. Or or is the that lettering actually, I mean, it does it does seem a little harder to make and more elaborate. Yeah, so in terms of complexity, it's like Chinese characters are much higher than Mm -hmm. uh, Latin script, which are the ones we're using for English. And part of it is also, they are kind of combinatorial, so there are elements you're reusing in different characters. And that's something we can't really account for properly. But in general, um, if you want to see writing systems that probably don't look like anything you're familiar with, the the game we designed has a lot of things that people are not familiar with. Uh, Hmm. What about as as there's, um, you know, crypto is becoming all of the rage now and it's kind of becoming its own culture and language seems like an interesting thing to study as this culture emerges some of it seems like um same as the old crap to me but um but there's there's so much where it's just like it seems like a lot of meme based communication it seems like a lot of meme based financial decisions are are being made where people are like Pfft. Dog's cute. I'm going to stick my money into that dog cartoon and let's see if it goes up or down. And and then and then I see other people write about crypto and in like bizarre codes that I wouldn't have any chance of of understanding. So I, I guess I guess maybe it's it depends on who the audience is in a lot of ways. Uh, like uh, there was lots of simplified COVID means, memes that happened. Uh, 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 and then there was, uh, you know, I, I, I follow a lot of academics on Twitter. So I see the actual data and things like, whoa, that is complex. Um, so there again, I guess it depends on how much information you're trying to convey in something. Um, do you, do you have any thoughts on, on, uh, on, on any of like, as, as new conversation and new cultural things and almost like new languages, um, take off what you expect to see in the beginnings of them? Or are you, have you taken an interest in, in crypto or anything (laughs) happening? I know I asked Um, like 20 questions in a row. No worries. Um, of my personal interest in cryptos is fairly limited, to be fair. Uh, <laughs> Mine too. Uh, it's been, Mine's very limited. Like, yeah, it's been mostly about whether it was going to show the same kind of characteristic as all the practices that quivered with trade when we started to expand it. Yeah. Um, so I'm not an expert at all in cryptos. Um, well, I wouldn't expect you to be. I'm just curious. I, uh, I don't know a thing about crypto. It's it's just in terms of. It seems like a new. It seems like a whole new vocabulary. It seems like a new language taking off. So I, I was just I was just curious if you've noticed just surface level without, like, not if you can explain what Bitcoin mm. is to me. <laughs> just like when you see people talking about it and putting it into language, if you've if you've noticed anything. Um, I feel like that's something I've been maybe a bit too far away from. Um, but another thing we've actually had another case study on was, um, again, like just characters mm-hmm. in uh, the vice script of Liberia, which was invented like 1830s, if I'm correct. Um, and in that case, we can really get um, pretty nice data points for its like first 150 years of life. And we actually get a pretty strong simplification over that time. Uh, so you can like see how those things were kind of complicated shapes and quite a fair amount of them got simpler fairly soon. So that's the only kind of thing I can think of that is kind of early life of a cultural yeah. tradition. Um, so it started so it started a little more am I would I be characterizing it? correctly to say that it started a little more brainstormy or maybe uh yeah a little showboaty to, uh, i'm sure you think of like a new letter and you're like oh look and you get to <laughs> unveil the new letter that you've developed and then over time people just go uh you know what we don't need all that can we just parse this down a little bit 
Um, so we don't necessarily know exactly those kind of things because it would require to, you know, I've known what people were going through. Yeah. Um, one thing is just, you know, as you're trying to like get people to learn the alphabet and yourself, you're using it over and over again. Sometimes you realize you don't really need that extra detail or this like loop over there or those kind of things. Yeah. Um, so we're just assuming over time it's just like <laughs> this loop mistakes. is killing my wrist. Can we just <laughs> not do this loop anymore? Yeah, cum that's interesting. Cumulative mistakes actually simplify simplifying the process, sort of. Yeah, and it's not even necessarily mistakes per se. It's you know just the fact that things are not transmitted perfectly. Yeah, um, yeah. And in general, that's that has been like a main theme of my scientific approach in general. Um, so what I'm getting onto now is not so much about those kind of transformations and mutations as it is about how little information can you go by for transmitting the same thing if you're transmitting very constrained systems. Mm. So basically, can you put information in the system instead of in what you're transmitting about the system? Hmm. So what's the... What what's some of your modern work that you're the most excited about? Um, so it's not yet out as a published article, but we have a preprint uh, about it with Simon Didio, uh, and we have a model where we are basically expressing a cultural practice, like for instance, um, any kind of way to do some kind of movement in sports as a network that has several constraints on it. Uh, and those constraints can be things as simple as like, you know, if your elbow is up, it's going to be more complicated to have your wrist down or those kind of constraints. You can put kind of whatever you want behind it. The idea is really just to have a general model. And the idea is if you're transmitting that from a teacher to a learner, and the way we model transmission is the teacher is giving the value of some of those nodes to the uh, learner, you can actually transmit only very little information, like around 10% for, at least for the size of networks we've studied and still get perfect results in most of your uh, students. Like they would have the whole network the same way the teacher had it. And mm. part of it is because if the learner has the same network of constraints, basically all those constraints are creating the same thing over without you having to transmit them. Uh, mm. So it's kind of like, what are those tricks in a way that human could have exploited to have very stable things without having to evolve very costly, high level, very detailed imitation processes, for instance. How do you retain more than 10% of the, the stuff that you want to pass down, essentially? <laughs> I, I, and it's being done on some sort of um, subconscious cultural way that that's stumbled upon that works. So. Uh, Am I like so? The way in which culture transmitted itself, uh, the, the way in which culture um, was transmitted, the the transmission itself kind of was shaped by um, evolution too. Yeah. In, um, in how effective it was. Yeah, that's a general assumption, um, and usually it's kind of showing that humans, for instance, can imitate with much higher fidelity than like chimps or our other relative primates. What I'm more interested in is how did we manipulate systems that were very constrained in a way that if I'm asking you to copy me, it's actually really easy for you to copy me. Mm -hmm. uh, so examples I use are from horse riding because it's something I've been doing forever. Um, and part of how you transmit horse riding is also using horses and equipment that actually constrain your position a lot. And part of what I want to suggest in general and try to investigate is how much can we spare in terms of information we need to transmit to someone if we're exploiting all this network of constraints we have around. I see. So there's there there's certain things when you're riding a horse that your legs are just like naturally going to fall in place in a certain yeah. way and you don't need to over explain now like keep your right leg in the same position as your left leg cuz people naturally are going going to do that. So so you would need to um focus more of the uh transmission effort onto the things that are perhaps more like counterintuitive. 
uh, or, and, and, and maybe not, not as, uh, uh, not as much of a default or, um, yeah, natural. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and it's also like, for instance, I can give you an advice or a comment or an instruction that is really just on one part of your body, but just because of the way you're interacting with the physical environment, plus constraints that come from bodily organization, you actually don't need to have much more information to get in the right position. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you're kind of like economizing, uh, or like getting by to have the same result with a lot less information transmission per se. Hmm. Okay. Um, and, and how do you, so how do you go about studying something like that? Um, so, so far what we've done is really just modeling work. Uh, so very abstract theoretical work. Um, the hope depending on how my own career goes is to start, um, having also experiments where we can actually kind of get similar ish. Um, yeah, just like experiments where we can manipulate those constraints and see how it influences how people can, uh, transmit on skills or acquire them. Okay. Um, well, this is all, this has been a really interesting conversation. I've never really talked about these subjects before. <laughs> Super cool. cool. Um, it, can you once again, just kind of maybe, uh, do a little call to action for me or, or a little, a little summary for the listeners about the, uh, the introduction to open science, um, course and, uh, what, what, uh, what people that might appeal to and, and what that's about, and, and then anything else that you would like to uh, direct people to of yours, where they can find out more. Okay, um, so the um, Open Science course is available on Complexity Explorer, which is uh, the Center of Institute's um, massive online open courses website. And actually all the uh, videos are also under Creative Commons licenses and available on YouTube as well. Mm. And it's really, um, kind of tutorial slash quick introduction and around six hours of videos to what is open science, what are all the different um, scientific practices you can find under it. And it's kind of both for anyone who's curious about the scientific process, but also everyone who's either starting their career as a researcher or like even an internship and kind of want to um, get started with those. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was really coming from my own experience as a young researcher who started to learn them and couldn't really find everything in the same place, uh, nor something that just tells you what is the vocabulary for what. Uh, so that's mainly what you can find uh, about it. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Elena, uh, uh, Elena Matone, everybody. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. And we'll see you next week.